we're in part two of our series on death and dying and so forth. Part two, we call the mystery of our destiny. What's our predicament today? There is a dark side to all of this, of course. We realize that we are vulnerable to a deceiver. We have an adversary. And this adversary isn't the, the typical devil or Satan that get pictured in the literature or in Halloween or whatever. He can masquerade as the angel of light. And his basic technique is deception. So we're entering an area that, in which deception is our primary, uh, the primary tool of our adversary. So we run into all kinds of information that in modern terms is called channeling. And, all, and, and the spiritism and all this sort of thing is in the periphery of our discussion here. But in Leviticus, Deuteronomy, Isaiah, 1 Corinthians, shreds that as being prohibited. Not just something you shouldn't do, it was punishable by death in ancient Israel. And among these things is communication with the dead. It's disturbing how many, even Christians, think that that's an okay kind of thing to try. And clearly, it is not. Deuteronomy 18 expressly prohibits it. Many people get confused by the peculiar episode in 1 Samuel 28 with Saul and the witch at Endor, where Saul consults a medium. But in this case, God intervenes, and some very strange events occur that even the medium is shook, and announces to Saul, that is, God announces to Sir Samuel announces to Saul that he will die the following day. So uh, it's, it's clearly that a very, very spooky passage in 1 Samuel 28, worth your study, but certainly does not endorse or encourage this idea of necromancy. And as we touch on these topics, which are peripheral to our central issue, I want to just underscore that there are issues here that are dangerous because uh, there are, uh, some of you may be familiar with the novel, William Blatty's novel called The Exorcist that was made into a movie. I was on the board of Walter Martin's ministry at the time when he went, set out to debunk that because he was very upset by it for a number of reasons. And he was startled to discover that William Blatty had done his homework. It was built on a composite of several real-life case studies. You may recall in the story, all those horrible things came about. It all got started because this child was messing around with a Ouija board. So things like Ouija boards, Dungeons and Dragons, some of these games are not harmless toys. And that's why some people are so concerned about the Harry Potter series that are so popular as Christian stories and so forth, is that they're dangerous. They're websites and so forth that encourage serious involvement in witchcraft and such. These things are called entries, and they can damage lives, and they can be used by what I'll call the dark side to our uh, adverse uh, adversity. So, and reincarnation is another one of these. We joked about it earlier. But clearly the scripture in Hebrews 9.27 is appointed unto man but once to die and then the judgment. There's no recycling going on here. That's a, a uh, myth out of the pit of hell. And so we do encounter, especially lately, lots of books and materials on the so-called near-death experiences. And I'm not going to catalog or get into those because they are, at best, doubtful sources of information on the subject that we're pursuing. There are some near-death experiences that are authenticated. There's one in Acts chapter 7, when young Stephen has given his presentation to the Sanhedrin. He gives the most august Jewish body of that time a lesson or a review of Old Testament history. And uh, they interrupt him and have him stoned. And as he's stoned, in Acts chapter 7, verse 56, he sees Jesus Christ standing, waiting for him. So this idea that a Christian that dies is immediately greeted by the Lord himself on the other side of that portal is scriptural. Stephen's an example of that. Paul is another example. He talks about in 2 Corinthians 12 that there was an occasion 14 years earlier. He speaks of it in the third person, but clearly it's him. Caught up into what he calls the third heaven. That was a Greek term because that first heaven was considered the sky where the birds fly, the second heaven the stars, the third heaven is the heaven that you and I think of as heaven. And he was caught up there, only to hear things that, uh, that could not be uttered. It's interesting that he says it was 14 years earlier, and if you do your homework in Acts 14, it's that 14 years earlier he was at Lystra where he was stoned and left for dead. And scholars argue that it may have been a near-death experience or it may, he actually may have been resurrected from the dead because they left him and thought he was dead. So whether he is or not, that's a scholastic debate. But clearly, that may be what gave rise to Paul's uh, experience that he records in 2 Corinthians 12. 
But as we go into any other sources in the scripture, let's be on our guard because Satan's primary weapon is deception. And his agenda is to have you destroyed. That's his goal. And he has incredible resources to try to bring that about. And so he would like you to believe that there is no such thing as a judgment, that there is no real accountability to our creator. Anything that tends to suggest that has as its origin Satan's lie. All the way to Genesis chapter 3, his first lie, which was to create doubt. Yea, hath God said that, and then direct denial. Ye shall not surely die, he tells Adam, which of course was a lie. You know, it's interesting, the other idea that Satan would like you to believe is that there are many paths to God. And Jesus talked about that. He says, broad is the way, wide is the gate that leads to destruction, Jesus said. Narrow is the gate that leads to, to, to salvation. And so we need, if you're going through a gate... That's very popular and lots of people are joining you. Be careful. You probably have the wrong gate. So let's move on here. We talked last night in the previous session about a ten-dimensional universe. The original creation may well have been far broader than we know today. And when Adam fell, when Adam submitted to Satan, for, then this was fractured in the minds of some analysts. The four dimensions that you and I experience, length, width, height, and time, that we would call the physical universe, were separated from six other dimensions that we know exist but can't get at directly and uh, sometimes called the hyperdimensions. The biblical term would be the spiritual world, which is all-encompassing. It's a broader, more inclusive term, where the physical universe is a subset, if you will, of the total. The, what are the effects of the fall? Well, first of all, the possibility is that the universe was fractured. Separation of four and six dimensions is, is a suggestion by some. Um, separation of the physical and the spiritual. But one of the things that a group of us believe is that was also at Genesis chapter 3 of the fall of Adam is when the bondage of decay was instituted. In modern terms, we call that the entropy law, the second law of thermodynamics. And uh, the reason we believe that is because of Romans 8, which describes that the creation itself is, is, is uh, waiting the day where it will be relieved from its bondage of decay, as the term Paul uses. And that's so descriptive of the entropy laws. And so that's a possibility I'm suggesting. But the main point I'd like to get across is the redemption. God's plan of redemption involves more than just you and me. It involves a new creation. Isaiah and, and, and also John in Revelation says, I see a new heavens and a new earth. It's not just you and I and the earth. Even the heavens apparently are recreated, a new heavens and a new earth. So there's much more going on here that's in God's interest. Now, one of the things that we do when we go through the, the uh, first chapter of Genesis, when we study it carefully, we notice that we have there the gradual introduction of order. Entropy is the opposite of order. It's randomness or chaos. So on a chart with entropy maximized at the bottom and minimized at the top, we see those days as step-by-step -step, uh, improve, uh, 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 improvements in less entropy, reducing entropy. And so it, uh, there is a major cha change that occurs at the fall. Everything we know about the creation is post-curse. We have very little insight as to what the creation was like prior to Genesis chapter 3. You can't prove to me that Adam lived in only three dimensions. I'm not saying he did, but we, we just don't know. We do know that he apparently was clothed with light so that when he lost that, he knew he was naked in a much more profound sense than simply that he had no clothes on. And so history as we know it really starts from Genesis 3 and following. And there's a second place where the entropy, the, the, the disorder is introduced, and that, of course, is at the flood. The flood of Noah involved far more than just a lot of water. Some major changes occurred in the basic ecology of the planet Earth, which is a study in and of itself. And, of course, it's been decaying since then. All of us are victims, if you will, of these little charts in National Geographic or Scientific American or what have you of the ascent of man, the caveman that gradually grows up to be modern man. And we, while we reject evolution as such, we still find ourselves... Uh, subject to these misconceptions. It could very well be that ancient man was far brighter, certainly far more sophisticated spiritually than we are today. It's been a decline, not an ascent. But let's go to Genesis 3 a little bit, which is the seed plot of the entire Bible. And of course the villain of the piece is the Nachash, the shining one, one that later becomes the serpent and so forth. And the whole story of the forbidden fruit, which was emblematic of their rebellion, their, not, their, their failure to stay in subjection to the Creator Himself. It's interesting to study carefully the methodology of our adversary. Two primary steps. His first was to introduce doubt. He said to Eve, Yea, hath God said? That's called doubt. And then as soon as he got that beachhead, he then went into direct denial. Ye shall not surely die. God lied to you. 
That's exactly the procedure that Satan uses today. It's exactly the kind of deception you and I are, are vulnerable to if we don't carefully cling to the Word of God itself. Now, the result of Adam's fall, of course, was God declaring war on Satan. Notice the initiatives on God's part. And in Genesis 3, verse 14, 15, he declares war. And there are two participants that will emerge from that declaration. The seed of the woman, which becomes the title of Jesus Christ, and the seed of the serpent. In Genesis 3, verse 14, it says, The Lord God said unto the serpent, Because thou hast done this, thou art cursed above all cattle, above every beast of the field. Upon thy belly thou shalt go, and dust shalt thou eat all the days of thy life. And I'll put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. And here we have an allusion to the seed of the woman, which is a contradiction not only in grammar, but in biology. Because obviously, the, 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 But this is a hint here of the virgin birth, which Isaiah will pick up on and, of course, becomes a primary thread in the New Testament. But many people overlook that there's two seeds here. The other seed is the seed of the serpent, who will bruise his head, but thou shalt bruise his heel, which, of course, happened at the cross. So we want to be, there's a whole study that you can get into on that one. But the basics are the fall of man is the basis of death. Death was not originally intended. Death is the result of the fall of man. Death is an ins uh, inescapable e fact. We mentioned that from Hebrews 9.27. is appointed unto man but once to die and after this the judgment. Science will never conquer death. That's mentioned in Job 14 and Ecclesiastes 3, but I think it's pretty self-evident if that's the cause of it. Death is man's punishment for disobedience. Romans 5 hammers on that, Romans 6, James 1, and so on. Now the point you want to get across here is death is separation of the body and the soul. Separation is not annihilation. There's some that would like to cling to the appealing idea that, uh, that uh, losing is to, be, is to cease to exist. Unfortunately, it's not that simple. Now, the sufficiency of Christ's atonement, which is the primary theme of the Bible from Genesis 1 to Revelation 22, the sufficiency of Christ's atonement undercuts any theory of reincarnation or transmigration. Hebrews 1.3, 1 John 1.7, 1 Peter 2.24 are just a few examples where that's nailed, if you will. Now, there are some terms that occur that always get translated to hell and thus get con cause confusion in the English translations. So let's examine a few terms that we need to get straight in our minds. The first is the Hebrew term, Sheol. It is not the grave. The grave is the destination of the body. The Sheol is the destination of the soul. The location of the departed souls, the abode of the dead, both good and bad, is said in the Hebrew to be Sheol. Many people get confused about this. The first place it occurs in the scripture, which is always a highly relevant occasion, what they call the law of first mention, occurs in Genesis 37, 35, when Jacob is confronted with the apparent death of Joseph. They bring his garments and convince him that he's been killed. It's clear that Jacob assumes that his son was still conscious after death, in his remarks, and that he would ultimately be united with him. This is useful. Now, Joseph really wasn't killed, but he didn't know that. But the point is, it reveals his whole conception. Jacob assumes that his son was still conscious after death. Very important. And he also takes for granted that he will ultimately be united with him when, they, when they're both dead. Now, the term Sheol could not mean grave because he'd apparently been devoured by an animal. There's no, nothing to bury. So the Sheol does not mean grave. By the way, he is still his son. After death, we still retain the relationships, father, son, children, and so forth. Still retained his identity. Jacob also says he's, he will go down to Sheol. Again, we find that the word Sheol, as the, as the Greek word, equivalent word is Hades, are geocentric concepts. It's as if it's down there in the center of the earth. That's maybe not literal, but it's certainly idiomatically the way they view it. Now, the opposite is kiver, which is grave. It's not synonymous. In fact, it's the obvious. In the, in the Septuagint, that's the Greek translation of the Hebrew Old Testament, Sheol is never translated menima, which it's always translated as Hades. It's always contrasted, never equated with Sheol, that is, kiver is. Sheol is under the earth, underworld, lower parts of the earth, and all through the scripture. Sepulchres in those days were in caves or above the earth, interestingly enough. So they're not even geometrically the same. Sheol is always the opposite of grave in that one sense, and it's the opposite of heaven in another. Now, the word uh, kiver or kiver means to bury. It's never used of Sheol. It can be pluralized. You can have multiple graves. Sheol is never pluralized. There's only one Sheol. Grave is located in a specific site. Sheol is never localized. 
The grave is accessible at death no matter where death takes place. Sheol is uh, accessible wherever death takes place. No grave is necessary to go to Sheol. As example is Joseph with Jacob. One can purchase or sell a grave. Sheol is never spoken of as being purchased or sold. You can own a grave as personal property. Sheol, nowhere is Sheol owned by a man. And bodies are unconscious in the grave, but those that are in Sheol are conscious. In Isaiah 14 and 44, Ezekiel 31 and 32, and Luke 16 that we'll look at shortly. The consciousness of people after death is crucial on both sides of this coin. Now the Greek equivalent term is Hades. In classic Greek, it has to do with Pluto, the god of the lower regions, or Orcus, the netherworld, the realm of the dead in classic Greek. But in biblical Greek, it's the infernal regions, the dark and dismal place in the very depths of the earth, the common receptacle of what? Disembodied spirits of whatever kind. Understand that Hades has a good, both Sheol and Hades receive both good and bad people. That's what throws a lot of people because they're both, often the word Sheol in the English translation is translated grave. That's unfortunate because it's very misleading. The word Hades is usually translated hell in the English, and that's also misleading for some reasons we'll get to. But in either case, Hades also, just like Sheol, is a geocentric concept. It's as if they're in the center of the earth, at least idiomatically. Now, there's another term that Christ uses as distinct from Hades. It's the word Gehenna. And the word Gehenna originally referred to the Valley of Hinnom, which was south of Jerusalem. Jerusalem, as you know, has, is surrounded by three valleys. The Kidron Valley toward, on, the, on the east towards the Mount of Olives, uh, the uh, Hinnom Valley to the south, and the Teropian Valley or, uh, on, the, on the west. But the southern valley had a pretty dismal history. First of all, it, it was where they dumped filth and dead animals and so forth. Everything that was cast out would sit there, and they burnt, it was always burning. And it also, at one time in Israel's history, they offered their children to the god of Moloch, this bronze statue that they heated up red hot and put the babies in his arms. Um, and it was also done there at the Valley of Hinnom. So it has this dark, sinister history. It also became the city dump, if you will. And so it became, uh, there are 12 occurrences of this word in the New Testament. 11 of the 12 are by the Lord himself using it as an idiom for not the literal valley there, but as, a, as the ultimate destiny of the unsaved. Now, the, the, the unsaved are temporarily held in Hades or Sheol. Hades in the Greek, Sheol in the Hebrew. But the ultimate destiny later will be in the lake of fire, as it's often translated. The lake that burns with fire and brimstone and so forth. The word is often Gehenna there. Now, interestingly, interestingly enough, topologically, Gehenna is the opposite of Hades. Hades is in the center of the earth. Gehenna is in the outer darkness. So the two, I want you to get, the, there's a very, they're very distinctively different. You need to understand that Gehenna was, not, was, was specifically prepared as the destiny of Satan and his angels. Matthew 25, 41, Jesus says, Then shall he say also to them on the left hand, Depart from me, ye cursed, into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. So people that go there will be people that have disregarded God's provision to the contrary. Now, in Revelation 20, as the big climax finishes in Revelation, death and hell, are, that's Hades, are cast into Gehenna. That's called the second death there. So even Hades is temporary. Sheol and Hades are temporary. They're destined to be cast into Gehenna, in the outer darkness. Now obviously we find fire and brimstone all through the scripture so frequently that you can't dismiss it, the fire that never gets quenched. And I don't want to imply that there isn't a real fire, but I'm going to also suggest to you that they are metaphors, that what they really involve may be far more serious than any fire you and I have any conception of. The beast and the false prophet are thrown in those fires at the beginning of the thousand years. Satan's bound for a thousand years and then released for a while. And he joins them after a thousand years, and when he joins them, they're still there burning. So it's a fire that never consumes. So it's a very different kind of experience. I suspect that hell will be greater than all the weak and feeble metaphors that the human language can provide. I mean, you just recognize that. How else can we characterize... The ultimate alienation from God outside the limitations of time and space. We have, no, we have no capacity to imagine that. These may be metaphors to get across it. But let's, there is one report that's very thorough. Most of what we think we know comes from the Lord Jesus Christ himself in his narrative about the rich man and Lazarus in Luke 16. And I want to emphasize right up front that this is not a parable. 
In parables, the participants don't have names. In Luke 16, starting at verse 19, Jesus said, There was a certain rich man, there was a certain rich man, which was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously every day. And there was a certain beggar named Lazarus. He's got a name, so this is a real person, which was laid at his gate full of sores and desiring to be fed with crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. And moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. And it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. And the rich man also died and was buried. So that's the setup. That's the, that's the background here. Not a parable, a real event. The rich man in, the, in hell, in Hades in the Greek, he lift up his eyes, being in torments, and seeth Abraham afar off, and Lazarus in his bosom. Now this is interesting. Somehow, this isn't hidden from him, whether he literally see him or he's somehow conscious of the fact that Abraham's over there and Lazarus got it made. He's in his predicament. And he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me, and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. So again, it's a fire idiom going on here. He begs Abraham. And obviously Abraham can hear him because he's going to reply. Also recognize that Lazarus is there. Just can you give Lazarus this errand on my behalf, he says. But Abraham said, Son, remember that thou in thy lifetime received the good things, and likewise Lazarus the evil things. But now he is comforted, and thou art tormented. And besides all this, between us and you, there is a great gulf fixed, so that they which would pass from hence to you cannot, neither can they pass to us that would come from thence. So apparently they can communicate, but there is an impassable uh, gulf between them. You know, it's interesting, the rich man in no way says it's unjust. No way is he complaining that this is unfair. He's just acknowledging that he's in torment. And he goes on here in, in, in verse 27. Then he said, I pray thee therefore, Father, that thou wouldest send him to my father's house. Okay, Lazarus can't come see me. Send him to my father's house. For I have five brothers, that he may testify unto them, lest they should they also come unto this place of torment. The rich man knows he's got a father. He remembers his brothers. They're on his heart. His, that's his primary concern. That they don't in, get what he's got. Send Lazarus to them. He apparently understands that if they listen to Lazarus and repent, they can avoid this destiny. There's a tremendous amount of information here. The rich man knows his, his, his destiny. He knows it's permanent. He asks for Lazarus to warn his family so they don't fall into this mess. Abraham said to him, They have Moses and the prophets, let them hear them. He said, Nay, Father Abraham, but if one went unto them from the dead, they will repent. That's the rich man's assessment. If someone actually came back from the dead, that would impress them, see? Abraham said to him, If they hear not Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though one rose from the dead. It's interesting, of course, you can't miss the, the uh, situation that there was a different Lazarus that was raised from the dead. There's another concept that undergirds this, by the way. See, if they hear not Moses and the prophets, and they still won't believe, then sending them a witness from the dead will increase their punishment. You see, the withholding of that is a form of mercy. In Matthew 13, some events occur. From Matthew 13 on, Jesus spoke only in parables, and when you read Matthew 13 carefully, you'll discover that he explains to his disciples the reason he speaks in parables is so that they hearing, they won't understand. You say, that's a little weird. Uh, no, see, he knows they won't believe. And by speaking in parables, it lessens their punishment for not believing. If he's clearer and, they, and knowing they still won't believe, it'll deepen their punishment. It's strangely enough, it's elliptically an act of mercy. Bizarre, isn't it? Let's talk about the underworld as we understand it from Luke 16. Obviously, there's an underworld there. There's a place we, in the Greek we call Hades or in the Hebrew Sheol. It obviously includes, but not limited to, a place of torment. That's where the rich man is. But there's also a place, I'll call it the good side, that is called there Abraham's bosom. He's the father of all the faithful. So those that are faithful are in his bosom. And we get the impression clearly from Luke 16 that in Hades there's a good side and a bad side. And, there's a, and between the two there is an impassable gulf. 
See, that's why translating Hades as hell is misleading in the English, because we think of hell in the absolute negative sense, which of course it is. Hades is the abode, is equivalent to the Hebrew term Sheol, it's the abode of the dead. We've got the place of torment for the bad guys, so to speak, the wicked, those that are, uh, are destined, for the, destined for torment for, through eternity, and those that are in Abram's bosom, which are awaiting an event that I'll talk about in a minute. And there's a, you can't get from one side to the other. It's, it's, it's determined, not changeable. That's important. There are some other terms that come up, and let me bring them up here to avoid future confusion. There's also a term called the abuso in the Greek, typically translated the bottomless pit. And we find certain creatures are consigned to the abuso, which apparently is not necessarily part of Hades, or if it is, it's a deeper, deeper part. It's also the place from which the Antichrist comes, interestingly enough, in, in Revelation 11 and 17 and so forth. There's another term that shows up in the New Testament only once. Peter uses the term Tartarus. Most scholars presume from what he says it's probably equivalent to the bottomless pit. But in the, to the Greeks, Tartarus was, a, it's, not, it's the only place it occurs in the New Testament, but it's used in the Greek literature, and it is regarded as the, uh, a place that is as far below Hades as the earth is below heaven. So what is it? I don't know, but I don't, I don't want to go there. That, that term probably comes out of Homer's Iliad. So as a Greek piece of Greek vocabulary, it's a deep, deep, special, dark place that God has reserved for certain purposes. So now, some insights. We want to summarize what we learned from Luke 16. The man in Hades was fully conscious. He wasn't asleep. He had memory. He could speak. He experienced pain. He also experienced desires. And some of the most painful part of this may be the unfulfilled desires. His eternal destiny was irrevocably fixed. No reprieve. Not even discussed. He also apparently knew what he was experiencing was fair and just. He also knew what his brothers needed to do to avoid his own fate, namely repent. Interesting, it was a lot interesting. And by the way, he wasn't in hell yet. He was in that bad side of Hades. Now there's another thing that occurs at the cross. It's generally regarded by most conservative Bible scholars that between the time that Jesus died on the cross and that he rose that Easter morning, that he emptied Abraham's bosom. He took those faithful that were accumulated in Abraham's bosom to himself. Where do we get that? Well, let's talk about it. In 1 Peter 3, Peter writes, For Christ also hath once suffered for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit by which also he went and preached unto the spirits in prison, which sometime were disobedient when once the long suffering of God waited in the days of Noah while the ark was preparing, wherein few, that is, eight souls were saved by water. Now, when it says preached, we always think of preaching as trying to change somebody's mind. No, he's, the word there just means declare. Jesus went down there to declare his victory on the cross, his victory over death. That, by the way, was prophesied also. You may recall when Jesus was, when he opened his ministry in Nazareth, in Luke chapter 4, in the synagogue, he gets the copy of Isaiah, and he finds the place that we call Isaiah 61, and he reads it as his mandate for his ministry. He says, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because the Lord hath anointed me to preach good tidings to the meek. He hath sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of the prison to them that are bound and to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. And that's where he stops at that comma in Luke. What he didn't read is, and the day of vengeance of our God. He, his, his ministry mandate was up to that comma, which is what he did. His second coming, he'll deal with the day of vengeance of our God. So he's yet to do that, but that's yet future. But you'll notice was this proclaiming liberty of the captives and opening prison bound. That's where most scholars feel that, that that's what happened when he cleaned out Abraham's bosom, because the thief on the cross was going to be with him in paradise that very day, remember? See? Now, there's a very strange two-verse passage in Matthew 27 that no one knows what it means. We can only speculate. But it mentions there that, speaking of, of the crucifixion and, the, and the, the earthquakes and all that, it says, And the graves were opened, and many bodies of the saints which slept arose and came out of the graves after his resurrection and went into the holy city and appeared unto many. We have no other reference to that. We can only speculate what it refers to. Many scholars... See, John Walvoord pointed out that 
Jesus, on his resurrection, was the first fruits. That Sunday morning was the, it was the morning after Shabbat. It, it was the Feast of First Fruits. So Jesus clearly was the first fruits, but the word first fruits is plural. And Walford makes a Levitical kind of argument that he would be the first of, of a group to be a, a true first fruits offering. And so this plurality, Walford used to point to this, that these, it happens to be inserted during the description of the crucifixion, but it, it really alludes to something that happened after the resurrection that came out of the graves after his resurrection, went into the holy city, and so forth. And so this indeed may also be some of those that were in Abraham's bosom up till then. Now, now we're plunging right into this difficult, difficult area of the doctrine of hell. And uh, pastors typically will reluctantly acknowledge it, because it's clear the scripture says, flee from the wrath to come, and so forth. But as a result of it not being mentioned more, most people treat it strangely with indifference. It's a touchy subject, it's a tough, unpleasant subject, so we don't talk about it much. And because we're indifferent to it, there's widespread ignorance on this whole topic and all its ramifications. And because of the ignorance, we have doubt. Many people, many Christians, don't really believe in the hell. And uh, they're, they're thus in denial. They, they have several ways they try to get around this. And because of the denial, it gets to be an irritable subject, and that brings you right back to the lack of acknowledgement and so forth. So this is a tragic cycle that we're in within the body of Christ, within the church. Let's talk a little bit about the justice of God. There will be a last judgment. Every person is going to be resurrected and judged individually. Every hour of every life, every hidden thought, every motive, words spoken in secret, excuse me, will be made public. There will be no misinterpretations. All court cases will be retried, I suppose. All blame will be accurately proportioned. There'll be no unsolved crimes. There'll be no hidden bribes. The accounting of every detail of each of our lives. Every thought, every motive, and so forth. But also what everyone did with what they knew. To whom much was given, much is required. Did you know that all religions lead to God? Oh, they do indeed. The problem is, <laughs> it won't be Buddha, Confucian, or Muhammad, or whoever. It'll be Jesus Christ as judge. All religions are going to lead to the judgment, and the guy sitting on the judgment seat will not be any of these leaders. It'll be the person of Jesus Christ himself. Now the Father, we know from John 5, 27, the Father has given all authority for the judgment to Jesus Christ. So he is, he's got the whole ball game here. Now at, there's two judgment seats. At the Bema seat, all believers are rewarded because the ones that are there are saved. They're simply rewarded for their performance. They're not there because of their performance. But since they're there, they'll receive rewards. We'll talk about that shortly in 1 Corinthians uh, 3. And we'll look at that shortly. At the end of the millennium, there's the great white throne judgment, which consigns the, the wicked are resurrected and judged and consigned to their eternal state. And uh, so now... This, this final exam is very real. Jesus said, I say unto you that every idle word that men shall speak, they shall give account thereof in the day of judgment. Boy, boy. That, that's scary. Romans 1. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness, because that which may be known of God is manifest in them, for God hath showed it unto them. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. And uh, because that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. And professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. This is all coming home to roost at this final judgment. No exceptions. Everyone's going to be there. Now, by the way, Paul will later in Romans, Romans chapter 10, he'll quote Deuteronomy 30. The thrust of both his quote and also the original that he's quoting from is that men will be held accountable by the creation. He's accountable, but you can point to many other things, but that alone is enough to consign them to their eternal punishment, the failure to acknowledge the Creator. Peter comments in a similar vein in 2 Peter 3, knowing this verse, that there shall come in the last days scoffers, walking after their own lusts and saying, where's the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. Very interesting verse there because it links the concept of prophecy, the second coming, with the concept of the creation. See, they both presume God intervening in human history. But Peter goes on and says, for this they, are, they, for this they willingly are ignorant 
of that by the word of God the heavens were of old and the earth standing out of the water in the water whereby the world that then was being overflowed with water perished. He goes on. Willingly ignorant is the key phrase here. People who deny God are doing it as a decision. It's not an intellectual thing. It's a choice thing. So I have more about this punishment. That we know that the punishment is conscious. It includes passions, desires, memories, and regrets. It's eternal. Dante, in his literature, summarized it so well in one way. He says, abandon, he had, over the, he had it pictured that over the doorway, it says, abandon all hope who enter here. We have no ability to imagine what it's like to be without hope. I was, uh, had an opportunity at the Angola prison, the famous prison, the largest maximum security place in the, in the world. And uh, I had a chance to meet 13 of the people on death row some of which had been there for nine years with a pardon granted by the parole board but not signed by the governor. Obviously not likely to be for a lot of reasons. Even there, even in that what you and I would consider a hopeless situation, they still cling to a threat. They just may be. No, here, you and I can't imagine being totally without hope of any kind. One of the part of the punishment is to be exposed for your own sin for eternity. Disconnected from all painkillers and so forth. There's been a number of summaries trying to summarize all that we think we know about the impenitent. Certainly they'll be suffered from the loss of all earthly good, from the utter expulsion from the presence and favor of God. We can't imagine what that's like because we probably don't realize that every cell division in our body involves God's intervention. We can't imagine being disconnected from the source of all life. From the utter withdrawal of the Holy Spirit. We can't imagine that. For the consequent unrestrained dominion of saint and, uh, sin and uh, uh, sinful passions. Our own sin, our own sinful passions may be the source of a large portion of our punishment. From the operations of our conscience, from despair, from evil associates, from external circumstances, and from their per perpetuity. They never cease. This is one summary by Charles Hodge. There's others. There's, two, there's distributive justice, we call it mercy, God's grace. There's the retributive justice, and that's what we're talking about here. Why? For at least three reasons. To vindicate the king's righteousness. And the king of the universe, who has an intrinsic nature of righteousness. So it's, it calls for uh, these to be either uh, paid for or performed. Also to defend the moral order of his kingdom, this is essential, when you think that through. And also is essential in order to highlight the preciousness of the servant who died to make us just. Can't compromise any one of those three. It's not in God's nature. See, God loves everybody. He loves his son more. And he's going to vindicate the price that his son paid on our behalf. This retributive justice is the response of positive holiness, reasserting the moral order of the world against all that is evil. Can evil be forgiven? No. Satan and his angels are consigned there. They clearly are there forever. There's no, there's no compromise here. There are degrees of punishment. Not all are equal. To whom much is given, much will be required. We've talked about that. Clearly there's degrees of punishment. And I mentioned even earlier, that even withholding truth can be an act of mercy. Because if there's a truth, and God knows you're not going to believe it anyway, giving you that truth increases the punishment you're destined to. So that's a, a reality. Second Corinthians 8, 12 is an interesting verse. It says, Further, if there first be a willing mind, it is accepted according to what a man hath, not according to what he hath not. But there are difficulties for all of us. We all, if we're honest with ourselves, have difficulties with this concept of eternal punishment. Does the punishment fit the crimes or question? Well, that really begs a different question. Do we really understand God's attitude towards sin? I don't think so. I don't think so. Remember, adultery was a capital crime in Israel. We wouldn't even think of doing that in our culture. We can't handle that. <laughs> if we did, we'd probably cut the population less than half. Horoscopes were a capital crime. I won't ask for a show of hands how many people take a glance at the paper to see what their horoscope is. They just as a piece of entertainment or something. Every major paper has a horoscope column. In ancient Israel, to cast a horoscope made you punishable to death. 
God doesn't mess around. He took these things seriously. You see, our sensitivity to sin is calloused by our culture and our attitudes. See, we fail, fail to understand. There's two things we fail to understand. We don't understand the magnitude of sin on the one hand, but here's the real corker. We can't appreciate the majesty of God on the other. Part of the, the, the seriousness of sin isn't just the intrinsic in the sin itself. It's who is it against? And when it's against an infinite being, you see, sin is a violation of the character of an infinite being. Then we begin to get the message here, this, this serious stuff going on. A God deserving of worship cannot issue an arbitrary amnesty for humanitarians or pantheists who persist in worshiping and serving themselves more than their personal creator himself. The condemnation of everyone who is lost will be wholly attributable to himself or herself for having disregarded God's revealed will. And that will is sufficiently revealed just in the creation itself. That's the shocker to me. As you read your Bible, oh boy, there's lots of visibility. But it really amazed me to, that the Bible takes the position that just the creation itself is enough revelation for you to respond to. Now, people have contrived reasons to disbelieve. They come in three categories. One is called materialism. I'm not using it the way we would use it in terms of a cultural sense. Uh, philosophy, it's, it, it deals with the fact that the only real world is the material world. That's what that word means there. Well, that simply is an ignorance of the nature of reality. That, that, that term is really, in today's world, just being uninformed as the discoveries of modern physics. But in the two that are more common, one is called universalism. That's an attempt to take the forever out of hell. And annihilation is, is annihilationism, which attempts to take the hell out of forever. These are two attempts to get around what the Bible clearly teaches. Well, let's talk about universalism, which says essentially different ways of saying that eventually all will arrive you know, safely to heaven. And uh, you can't take that seriously for lots of reasons, but not the least of which, Satan and his angels would ultimately have to be reconciled to, be God, to, to God themselves, and they clearly are not, not it's not going to happen. Why? Because Christ did not die for them. It's Hebrews 2.16. The beast and the false prophet were tormented day and night for a thousand years until Satan joins them, and they were still there. And they are clearly tormented forever. The Greek is not ambiguous in that term. Also, universalism would contradict the Great Commission. Universalism has never been widely accepted among serious students of the Word of God, so it's not a real problem except to the uninformed. And all the supporting scriptures that are sometimes mustered in these discussions are taken totally out of context. It's not a serious uh, apologetic debate. Annihilationism is a whole other ballgame. It's sort of an attempt to talk about conditional immortality. Sounds like an oxymoron, doesn't it? And the key verse they love to pick on is Matthew 10, 28. It says, Fear not them which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul, but rather fear him which is able to destroy both the soul and the body in hell. And uh, Clark Pinnock and a number of... Uh, of, of People, uh, liberals hang on that verse to try to sell annihilationism as a possibility, except they're not doing a competent exegetical job here. The term in the Greek as a polemi, which means to be delivered up to eternal misery, not destroy in the sense of annihilate. It is never used to mean annihilate. It's used in Matthew 9, 17, Luke 15, 4, and John 6 uh, twice. And uh, so it, 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 it means to be delivered up to eternal misery, destroyed in that sense. I'm going to destroy your career, sort of as a way we might use an equivalent term. No, it doesn't mean destroy. It does not mean annihilate. Annihilationism is refuted by a number of passages. Matthew 20, just a few verses later, Matthew 25, verse 46, being, These shall go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous unto eternal life. And in both cases, the word is ionus, which is everlasting or eternal. Same word is used for eternal punishment and eternal life. You can't escape the linkage. The same meaning. Same thing in the Old Testament, in Daniel 12. Many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, and shame, and some to shame and everlasting contempt. Everlasting in both cases, same Hebrew word. And, of course, Revelation 14, The same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture unto the cup of his indignation, and he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels, in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment ascendeth up forever and ever. They have no rest, day nor night, who worship the beast and his image, and whosoever receiveth the mark of his name. Nothing temporary about this. Pretty serious language. The devil was that deceived and was cast in the lake of fire and brimstone, where the beast and the false prophet are, and shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. The beast and the prophet have been there for a thousand years when this happens. 
And they're still there burning. Well, we talked about the paradigm of death, where we have the physical death, the separation of the soul and the body, and the spiritual death, the soul and the spirit, and then the soul is resurrected to, for its ultimate death. But that's not for the believer. See, the believer has the Holy Spirit indwelling. And so indeed, he may experience physical death in terms of being separation from the body. But that's as far as it goes. Why? The second death was paid for on the cross. Jesus went there for us. So let's get to heaven a little bit. We've been to some pretty grim footage here. Let's take a little look here at some other things. The joys of heaven. It's a newly created environment that will be unsullied by any kind of moral evil. That itself speaks volumes. It'll include the ultimate model city. We, we see this new Jerusalem, and I'll show you a few renderings of that, but uh, let me tell you, no, they don't come close. <laughs> we'll enjoy a deathless existence in our resurrection bodies, and I'll talk a little bit about resurrection bodies. We'll be knowing and loving God maximally. Boy, that's, the, that's probably the best part of it all. We'll have fellowship with other believers. Now, I know there's some believers you just soon skip, but uh, we'll all have lost our sin nature by then. We apparently will retain our gender and personal and ethnic characteristics. That's interesting, but it's, it, 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 there's scripture that seems to indicate that. We'll have renewed intellectual, emotional, and volitional abilities, and that's also very exciting. But I do want to touch a little bit about children, because many of us are concerned about children. I get a lot of questions about this. Remember David's son in 2 Samuel 12. As long as the son was ill, he prayed and fasted. As soon as the son died, he scrubbed up and went back to work. And the servants were shocked. And he says, why are you so shocked? I will eventually join him. He knew that he would eventually join his son. Now, his son was a baby. Paul has a similar uh, expression, which causes, gives us confidence that children, while they're not before they're accountable, are, uh, are, are saved. Paul, in Romans 7, where he talks about the whole role of the law and so forth, in verse 9, he says, For I was alive without the law once. But when the commandment came, sin revived and I died. When you analyze that carefully, the only time it could have been when Paul was before the age of accountability, he apparently was saved. Because he wasn't regarded as having the law. Now, the children are not innocent. They die. But their accountability is waived. Because they're subject to death just like Adam. In Romans 5, 12 and elsewhere. But I want to share something that most people overlook that I've discovered is, a, is an incredible insight for some of you in the audience. The book of Job opens up. There was a man in the land of Uz whose name was Job. And that man was perfect and upright and one that feared God and eschewed evil. And there were born unto him seven sons and three daughters. His substance also was 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 500 yoke of oxen, 500 she-asses, and very great households, so that this man was the greatest of all the men of the East. And you all know the story. Satan is allowed to, one by one, take away his good things and his family and even his health. We're sitting on this ash heap, and most of the book are these dialogues between these three characters that he calls his friends. <laughs> and friends like that, you don't need enemies. Um, and then at near the end, of course, God speaks on behalf of Job. The last four chapters are fantastic chapters. But I don't want to get into all that here. Most of you, I think, are familiar with the basic story. But I want to show you in chapter 42, the last chapter of the book of Job, by now the Lord has you know, turned the captivity of Job and, pray, and when he prayed for his friends. And also the Lord gave Job now twice as much as he had before, Scripture says. So the Lord blessed the latter end of Job more than his beginning. For he had 14,000 sheep, 6,000 camels, 1,000 yoke of oxen, and 1,000 she asses. Then it says, in verse 13, he also had seven sons and three daughters. Well, if you're paying attention, this bothers you a little bit. Because sheep, camels, oxen, and she asses, he originally had 7,000, 3,500 each of the last two. And he had seven sons and three daughters. When God restores double everything he had before, afterwards he has 14,000 sheep rather than seven, 6,000 camels rather than 3,000, and 1,000 each of oxen and she asses against the 500 before. So he's got twice as much of his livestock. And he gets seven sons and three daughters. And if you've been paying attention, you look at that, gee, that doesn't seem right, because God gave him twice as much as he had before. You sort of feel he got shortchanged on the children thing, right? That's because we don't know how to count. Because he didn't lose the seven sons and three daughters. They're in heaven waiting for him. When God doubles what he had, he gives him seven more sons and daughters. It's counted double because he'll have 14 sons and six daughters when he gets to heaven. I mention that because some of us have lost a loved one. I think it was Carl Jung that said a the death of a child is like putting a period before the end of a sentence. And God knows all about losing sons. Well, let me talk a little bit more about the geometry of eternity. We talked before about this line... Behind us is the past, ahead of us is the future. 
And God, of course, can see the end from the beginning. You recall this from the earlier session. I want, to know, I want you to notice something. I'm just going to suggest a speculative possibility to stretch your horizons here. Those arrows, arrows can point the other way. Somebody that died in the past, someone that died last week, and someone that gets raptured, say, three weeks from Tuesday, all could arrive at the throne simultaneously because they're outside the dimension of time as we know it. I'm not saying they do. There's lots of other aspects to this. But I, I, I suggest this to stretch your imaginations because we're going to move into some other strange directions here. We're going to talk about a resurrection body. What kind of bodies are we going to have? Well, we need to understand the lesson of Jurassic Park. Most of us have seen the, in Michael Crichton's novel, or either his movie or his novel. In Jurassic Park, these prehistoric creatures were created by a piece of information. The DNA embodied in blood in a... In a, in a um, Mosquito that was embedded in amber for thousands of years, presumably. By taking that DNA, they could recreate, they could clone and recreate these creatures. That's the concept of the story. It's not a far stretch from science as we think of it. But the point it teaches is a couple of things. The molecules are fungible raw materials. Carbon atoms, hydrogen atoms, I don't know which ones. Put those together for sugars or glucose or whatever. All that was needed was a piece of information. All God needs to resurrect you. He doesn't need your atoms that are decaying at the bottom of the ocean or in a grave or something. He needs your DNA, maybe a little more. And with that, he can recreate, we resurrect your body. He doesn't have to use the hydrocarbon chemistry. I'm just using that as an example. In fact, it seems pretty clear he doesn't. He uses something else. We do know that our bodies are going to have more than three dimensions. How do we know that? Because Christ did. Christ in his resurrection was able to enter and leave a room without passing through the floor, ceiling, or the four walls. And they thought he was a ghost. He says, a ghost has not... You know, uh, have flesh and bone, handle me and see. He is very tangible on the one hand, and yet he possesses dimensional qualities that absolutely defy our understanding because we're limited to a three-dimensional uh, concept here. He is not. Now, there's one of my favorite verses of 1 John 3, 2. We'll look at it in a minute. There is a term in the Bible, it only occurs twice. The word is oketerian in the Greek. In 2 Corinthians 5, 2, it speaks of the body, the habitation we aspire to. In Jude, verse 6, it's the, it's the body that the angels disrobed themselves from in order to participate in the mischief is Genesis 6. We do know we retain personal knowledge in our identities. Remember the uh, transfiguration that disciples could recognize, Moses and Elijah and so on. But 1 John 3, 2 is a verse that tells far more than most people can extract from it before they realize what it's saying. John says in his first letter, he says, Beloved, now are we the sons of God... And it doth not yet appear when we shall, what we shall be. But we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. We don't know what he's going to be like, but we know that when he will appear, we will be like him because we will see him as he actually is. What he's saying, we're not going to see a two-dimensional representation of a three-dimensional being like a picture. We're not going to see a three-dimensional representation of a four-dimensional being or whatever. We shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Whatever dimensionality he enjoys, so shall we. That's what this is saying. Wow, that's exciting. Now, I want to talk a little bit more about hyperspace. We talked about it a little bit last session, but there's only two kinds of people that can deal with hyperspace. It's based on more than three dimensions. Mathematicians with special training and small children. Okay? Now, you and I can't think of four or five, six dimensions to take special training. But we can get some insights by going down in our imagination rather than up. And I want to imagine a two-dimensional universe. And I'm going to introduce you to two friends of mine. And they suffer from a very serious handicap, so be kind. They, 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 they only have two dimensions. They're Mr. and Mrs. Flat. Okay? And I'm drawing here on some insights from uh, Edwin Abbott, a churchman of the turn of the century, or the 19th century, uh, you know, 20th century. Um, he developed this in, in, in uh, some interesting ways. But anyway, it's Mr. and Mrs. Flat. Now, they suffer because they only have uh, t uh, two, uh, they only live in two dimensions. Now, when Mr. Flat looks at Mrs. Flat, she, he doesn't see two dimensions. He sees one. He sees a one-dimensional image of a two-dimensional person. Just like you and I see a picture, that's a two-dimensional representation of a three-dimensional person, right? But there's something else about, these, about this thing. If I come along as a three-dimensional person, I can put my finger a millionth of an inch away from Mr. Flat and my other finger a millionth of an inch away from Mrs. Flat, no matter where they are in their two-dimensional space. See, my proximity to either one is totally independent of the distance between them. I'd be closer to both of them than they can to each other, especially when they're separated. 
You understand? The, see the difference by having an additional dimension with it does for me. There's some other things. If I poke my finger through the universe, the universe is only two-dimensional universe, what will they see? Just a circle. You see? They can't see me. They only, they only know two dimensions. If I poke through, they, they, all they see is a circle. Okay? If a ball comes flying through the universe, it looks like a point that opens up to a circle and closes down. They have no grasp of a three-dimensional object, right? You with me? See, they, they have a limitation only because they only have two dimensions. Now, I mentioned in the previous session, I mentioned about Paul in Ephesians 3, 17, 18, that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith, that ye being rooted and grounded in love may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and depth and height. And you may recall that Paul apparently is sensitive, or at least the Holy Spirit writing through Paul is, that there are at least, we live in four dimensions. Now, how do you communicate now a three-dimensional object to Mr. and Mrs. Flat? Pretty tough to do. I could do it maybe by a two-dimensional projection, I could take a three-dimensional object like a cube and give them a, you know, orthographic projection like an ar a, a architect would, but that isn't that useful to them. They don't understand that. Uh, I could do a three-dimensional projection of the four-dimensional. That doesn't that, that, uh, that doesn't help. See, uh, it, doing a three-dimensional object in two dimensions doesn't help. If I'm trying to show you in three dimensions what a four-dimensional cube looks like, a hypercube as they call it, that doesn't help you much. Not very useful, is it? How am I going to communicate? A three-dimensional object in two dimensions. One way I can do it is I can unravel it. I can take the cube, the three-dimensional box, say, and I can fold it out the way you would a box and try to use that to communicate to them what three dimensions are. But you can tell it's not going to be too useful to Mr. and Mrs. Flat, is it? There is a way to take a four-dimensional cube, it's called a Hinton cube, and unravel it into three dimensions. Here's a four-dimensional cube unraveled in three dimensions. You say, well, is that the only place I've ever seen this useful other than a mathematics textbook? is by Salvador Dali when he rendered his famous painting, Corpus Christi. He was sophisticated enough to realize that that's a multi-dimensional, it's a four-dimensional thing going on in three dimensions, which is kind of interesting. Well, people wanted pictures of New Jerusalem. You see the classic renderings in the Renaissance art style. You find people talking about this cube that comes down, and it's got, you know, 1,500, it's got um, 12,000 furlongs on a side, yet the walls are 72 feet or whatever. It just doesn't compute. And this is the Borg cube if you, for you Star Wars, or, or Star Wars friends. That's the cube from the dark side, actually. But, but the point is there's been people that try to render this. And the reason I haven't spent much time on this is because all of these people missed the point. This is not a three-dimensional cube. It's a, a residence of multi-dimensional bodies, you and I in Christ. So I wouldn't even try to render it in three dimensions. It's a waste of time. Well, let's wrap this up here. What is the gospel? We've talked this, we talk, we take this term very frequently. Many, what is the gospel? New, the, the good news. No, the gospel is something very specific, and you will not hear it from most pulpits in America. Paul says, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which ye have received, wherein ye stand, by which also ye are saved, if ye keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. Can you believe in vain? Absolutely. The devils also believe in tremble, James tells us. I declare unto you the gospel. The next few verses, they define what the gospel is. I deliver unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for us in according to the scripture, that he was buried, and then he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. Three things, that he died according to, for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried, he rose the third day. What's astonishing about this definition of the gospel, there's no mention of his example. Many people would acknowledge him. He's a wonderful example of many things. There's no mention of his teachings. Many people acknowledge he was the greatest teacher ever lived, or all that sort of thing. There's no mention of his miracles. Lots of people seem to go around doing miracles, it would seem. No, what is the gospel? That he died for our sins according to Scripture. He didn't disappear, he died. But he didn't just die. He died for our sins according to the Scriptures. Dozens of specifications were fulfilled in the way he died. The cross, the crucifixion of the cross was not a tragedy, it was an achievement. Achievement by the Creator himself to facilitate our redemption. He was buried. Paul, only Paul emphasized that because he makes a case of making an analogy there with baptism. And then he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. And then the rest of the chapter goes on. That he was seen of Cephas and the twelve, and that he was seen of the above five hundred brethren all at once, of whom the greater part remain in this present, but some are falling asleep. The people that he's writing to include eyewitnesses. There are five hundred up in Galilee that saw him, and some of them are present in this church. The last of all he's seen of me also as one born out of due time. 
And now Christ has risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that slept. Since by man came death, by man came also the resurrection of the dead. As in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. Adam was the son of God. The rest of us are sons of Adam. Sons of God is an Old Testament term by uh, the, the Benai Ah Elohim. It was used of Adam and of angels, direct creations of God. You and I are not. You were descendants of Adam. We carry a sin defect. Jesus came unto his own, John tells us in John chapter 1. He came unto his own, his own received him not. But as to as many as received him, to them gave he the power to become the sons of God. It's a new birth. That's why the word born again is not just a figure of speech. It's very, very real. Anyway, but every man in his own order. Christ the first fruits, and afterwards they that are Christ at his coming. Then cometh the end, when, she, when he shall have delivered up the kingdom uh, to God, even the Father, when he shall have put down all rule and all authority and power, for he must reign till he hath put all enemies under his feet, and the last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. Praise God. And he said, Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall be changed. There's some, in other words, that live, where he makes a change in a moment. And twinkling of an eye at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible. And we shall be changed, for this incorruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible shall put on incorruption, and this mortal shall put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? And he's quoting there from some very well-known Greek poets in that day. But thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. So God's the first act of religion back in Genesis 3, when Adam and Eve tried to cover themselves. With, to, to cover, that was the first act of religion, man's attempt to cover himself with God. God's plan of redemption was to make coats and skins and teach them, but by the shedding of innocent blood, they would be redeemed. On another tree, in another garden, they'd be covered. And from the seed of the woman, we have the whole story of God's redemption. From the seed of the woman, the call of Abraham, the tribe of Judah, the dynasty of David, the virgin birth, till we finally get to another tree in another garden, where the Lord Jesus Christ paid the price to give God the opportunity to uh, extend to us a complete pardon for all our sins and to be, make us eligible for an eternal destiny with him rather than being alienated from him. And God has many attributes. Infinite power, we can imagine that. Infinite knowledge, we can imagine that. Creation manifests both of these. But how do you manifest infinite love? How does God demonstrate that? Knowing that if man was left free to choose, he would enter into a predicament that only the death of God could suffice to extricate him. Greater love hath no man than he that lays down his life for his friends. This whole manifestation is God's way of demonstrating infinite love. There's, there's no salvation in any other. There's none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. We have that present, t pre present right now today. This is not something you get later. He that believeth on the Son already hath everlasting life. He that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. There are only two categories here. What's the basis of your faith? Well, I'm as good as the next guy. Really? Strike one. Well, I'm doing the best I can. Strike two. I try to live by the Ten Commandments to serve them out. Really? Strike three. You can't make it. But Christ has paid the price for you. According to the grace of God, which is given me as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation. Another buildeth thereon, but let every man take heed on how he buildeth thereon. No other foundation can no man lay, for other foundation can no man lay, than that is laid, which is Christ, Jesus Christ. If any man build upon this foundation, gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, stubble, I put it this way, there's two different categories. There's six things, but they're in two different categories. Some are combustible, some aren't. Gold, silver, precious stones, or wood, hay, stubble. Every man's work shall be made manifest, for the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire. And the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. So what are you building on? Gold, silver, precious stones, or wood, hay, stubble? If any man's work abide which he hath built thereon, he shall receive a reward. If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss. But he himself shall be saved, yet so is by fire. Very, 1 Corinthians 3 is one of those passages we don't preach enough of because it's, it's all about rewards. You don't earn your way into heaven, but if you qualify for heaven by believing in Jesus Christ, you'll be entitled to rewards depending on how you lived your life. You don't get there by living your life a certain way. You get there by trusting Jesus Christ. But if you're there, there's obviously a difference. Now, there are people whose lives are shambles, that when the fire, there'll be nothing that survives, but they 
themselves are still saved. Why? Because Jesus saved them. They didn't. We need to understand rewards. There's diff- just as different degrees of punishment in Hades or hell. There's also different degrees of entitlement, if you will, in heaven. But the way you get to what determines which place you go is your position with Jesus Christ. Now, we've talked about timelines. One last one we'll call it, that, call it an evening. We have, in the past, it's behind us. The future is ahead of us. We are now. The past is but a memory, the future but a hope. The question I want to ask you is, where is your connection to eternity? Most of us think of that as being yet future. The ultimate, you know, well, eternity is, is after death and so forth. No, no. Your eternity, your connection with eternity is right now. You are right now either destined for eternity in heaven or eternity in hell, depending on your position with respect to the person of Jesus Christ. And you're heading for a foreign country, and the only place they issue visas is on this side of the border. Your personal, your, your position in Christ. So why are we doing this presentation now? Because your eternity is only a heartbeat away. It can be a plane crash, a car crash, it can be a stray bullet, it can be an unexpected stroke. How many of you in the audience have had someone in your immediate surroundings, family or friends, suddenly die unexpectedly in the last year or so? Look at that. See, you have more than half the hands. You, too, have an appointment. There are no accidents in God's kingdom. And, and by the way, there's great comfort in that. If you, so many people should get rid of this, if only this, or if, if only I had driven, or if only we'd taken a different road, or if only we'd taken a different plane, or if only... If, no, 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 no. That's false guilt. There are no accidents in God's kingdom. God, we may not understand it, but God has his purpose, and there will be a calling. And the question I want you to think about is where will you find yourself when death calls? Will you be greeted at the portal by the Lord Jesus Christ as one of his, as an old friend of yours, someone that you've communicated with, someone that you've trusted and relied on? Or are you a stranger? Or will you be in the predicament of that rich man that we talked about in Luke 16? Do you know that rich man is a real man? And he's still waiting for the touch of a finger to cool his tongue? And how sure are you of where you're going? There's no reason to have any doubt at all. No doubt at all. What is the basis of your conviction as to where you're going? I want to remind you, Matthew 7, 21, 22, Not everyone that saith to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Many will say unto me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? And in thy name have cast out devils, and in thy name done many wonderful works? Then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. Heavy words. I think there are going to be many people who think they're going to heaven that haven't done their homework and are going to suffer as a result. Difficult topic. I hope this acts as a springboard, if nothing else, for you to do your homework and re-examine the conditions and the presuppositions that you're making regarding your eternal destiny. In God's name, let's bow our hearts for a word of prayer. Father, we just praise you that there are no accidents in your kingdom, that everyone listening to these words is there by your divine appointment. We do pray, Father, you'd give them no peace until they rest in you, that they discover the person of Jesus Christ and the extremes, Father, that you've gone to, that we might spend an eternity in your presence as we commit ourselves into your hands without any reservation. In the name of Yeshua, our Lord and Savior, that righteous judge. Amen.